Hey, welcome to the Insurance Buzz. This is your host, Michael Weaver. And today we have a special guest, Mr. Daryl Joma. Daryl, how are you this morning? I'm good. How are you doing, Michael? Man, I'm doing good. I hope you're ready to get buzzed on the buzz today, brother. (laughs) Yeah, I am. Daryl, thank you so much for your time and coming on this morning. Um, I appreciate it. Obviously, me and you have a a long-standing relationship to where we talk quite often, and you're an absolute stud. So I'm so 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 happy that you uh, you're coming on today. All right, if, if you say so. <laughs> so first and foremost, before we get into insurance, I got to know who was Daryl Joma before insurance. Well, I was a construction guy. Okay. I- I actually grew up on a dairy farm, and when I graduated high school, I went into construction. So spent the first couple of years pouring concrete, building homes, roofing, siding, all that type of stuff. Then I went into the, into the office and did a lot of estimating, project managing. That's kind of where I spent uh, the next 10 or so years was uh, just getting people going on the jobs, meeting with customers, doing their proposals, presenting them, ordering materials, all that type of stuff. So that yeah, along with uh i have beef beef cattle do some beef farming and so make hay and and uh raise cattle also man growing up on a dairy farm that's like you're you're early in the morning milking late at night milking like i can't even imagine <laughs> that's a lot of hard work yeah it was I'll, I'll tell you i left the day i turned 18 and and that was a good day to get out <laughs> the farm so. and then so how did you so I guess, so you're in construction, construction and construction management, it sounds like for quite a while. So 10 or 15 years, is that right? Yeah. Yep. It was about 15 years total. So how did you hear about, so what turned you on to insurance? Well, we were working at the time for uh, rural insurance and I was working, or I should say doing some of their, their uh, claims on projects. Okay. So I was working with their adjuster and he was a pretty good guy to work with. And that just kind of got me thinking a little about insurance and, and about more on the adjusting side, what that would be when I actually, the state farm recruiter reached out to me through LinkedIn, wondering if I was interested in it. And the first thing I told her was, well, I was actually thinking about being an adjuster or looking into that. And she said, well, you can uh, look into that if you want, but we're looking for agents. So if you're interested, I'll talk to you about that. I said, well, sure. Let's visit about it. So Okay. So that's what got it started. Okay. That's uh that's really, really cool. So what made you so what made you make the leap from construction over to agency owner? Now, because you owned your own construction business too. So correct. No, I didn't own it. I was working for my brother in law. Okay. Okay. What it was. So yeah, he, I so what made I, you make make that leap from construction to business owner in a profession that you probably knew nothing about you just were like this sounds like a good gig well I didn't know anything about it and what what made me think I actually remember that like the last year before we went into insurance I told my wife something's gonna change here I don't know what it is but I just feel like there's something coming in our future that's gonna change for the better and I told her it multiple times I didn't have any idea what it was gonna be but when then when this opportunity came up it made me think more about it seriously because i realized that i wanted to uh, own my own business or you know run my my own thing and i had enough friends and even my brother-in-law whoever that were in construction that i didn't feel like i wanted to do that in construction because i felt like i would be taking a lot of their customers away the, of friends those type things so when this came up it was, uh, it was just a good opportunity, and and I feel like I understood that a lot of the things that were in construction or, or in the office in construction, just dealing with customers, is was actually very similar similar to what we have now. I didn't realize that till later, but maybe one of the things I thought is there were a lot of things I learned from my previous employer that were very good, and some of them that I knew had to be done different. So both of them were very good learning experiences. Mm-hmm. To help yeah, me that's, that's, um, that's really, so I think I love the fact that you uh, had like this gut instinct that you knew something was going to change. 
you just didn't know what it was going to be yet. Um, and that you actually communicated as you know, Daryl, I'm a big manifester. All right. I think you gotta, I think you gotta write things down. I gotta, I think you gotta say things out loud. And so I love the fact I didn't know that about you. I love the fact that you knew there was a change coming. You just didn't know what it was. And then when the opportunity struck you, uh, yeah, you took it and you ran with it and you've done exceptionally well. I mean, you're, you're literally one of the best agents in the country year in and year out. So that's, uh, that's amazing. So I want you to touch base a little bit on though what you just said, things that you learned that you thought were really good that you wanted to do, and then maybe some things you learned that were like, ah, I don't know if I would do this in business. Like, can you remember? Have, does anything stick out to you when I ask you that? What you maybe you've learned from your your last employer, or even being in construction, that correlated over to you being as successful as you are in agency. Well, one of the big things that I learned that he taught me from a young age was if you. Uh, if you need something, need answers, or need to get a hold of someone, you just do it. And when I first would send in uh, material list to the lumber yard, they would they would get it and they'd say, "All right, when we get it done, we'll get it back to you." Well, I would wait a few days or a week or whatever, and and he would ask me, "Well, where's is that estimate done yet? You know, where's your?" And I would say, "No, I'm waiting on material list." Well, why are you waiting? Call and figure out what's taking them so long. So then it, it, I realized right then you got to follow up. So if you want something, you got to go out and get that. So it's the same thing that I talk about with the team here. Don't rely on somebody getting back to you. You know, people always tell you, oh, I'll call you with the payment information or I'll, I'll uh, get back to you tomorrow, things like that. And they just get busy and it's not that important to them at the time. So you got to follow up with them and get what you need to keep things moving. So, so that was one of the, one of the big ones. That's uh, a, <clears throat> that, that's a good one. Yeah. I, I don't, <laughs> that one does correlate over to the insurance world because consumers are, they, they don't even remember who you are after you <laughs> talk to them 24 hours later. So they're definitely not going to call and be like, Hey, let's get that insurance going. Yeah. The other one was, uh, I think what made me feel like it's when I look back, it's very similar. So I would go out to people's homes. I would uh, measure up their roof siding, or even they would come in the office. We would meet to uh, go over the plans on a new home. Well, it was, it was no different than insurance. You're building rapport. You had to make sure that they uh, liked you, trusted you. And, and if you, if you could get someone to like you and trust you, then they want to do business to you. They want to listen to you and then they want to do business with you. So it was the same thing. We were often uh, either the only price they would get or the highest price they would get when I was in construction. So we never sold on price. It was always on, on quality and why they wanted us to, to do the job. And it's the exact same thing we do in insurance, you know, in the office, we don't talk about price. We don't, we don't uh, expect to be the lowest price when we meet with people. And, and quite often we don't even know if we're the lowest price or not, because we just present what we have and, and put it in place. So. So I guess that's the other one is that if you just uh, have a conversation with people, care about people, try to figure out what they want and how you can help them solve their problem and educate them along the way, then they're happy to do business. And the last thing may be most important is you have to be excited about it. If you're not excited about it, uh, they're not going to be, you know, you don't want to come across as, as uh, I'm presenting this to you, but you don't really want it, do you? It's kind of, you know, sometime when you're lacking or when I'm lacking confidence or my team, that's what we'll, we'll see. And, and uh, then we train on it that, Hey, we got to change something there. You got to get excited about it. If you're not excited, they're not going to be excited. So. Woo, man, we are getting buzzed today. Y'all just hit, did you hear all those gold nuggets right there? No, like trust, enthusiasm, sells, man, you are, <laughs> you're full of little nuggets this morning, my man. That's, but that's so good. And you're so right because <clears throat> no like trust. Like that is the, you are a hundred percent right. People have to know you like you trust you. Insurance is tough because you have to establish that over the phone. So it's even more difficult to establish that. So in, in person, obviously, but a lot of the sales with brand new prospects might be done over the phone. They may not know who you are. So you have to do a really good job of learning how to build that no like trust over the, over the phone. And then obviously you got to control the controllables, exactly what you said, and doing the right thing, like being genuine, enthusiastic, excited, 
giving them more coverage, making sure they're adequately protected, solving problems. Who cares what the price is? Your job is to make sure they're adequately protected. And I know, I know you all do that. That's man, that is, that's golden. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, been going well and it seems like we improve a little more each year. So that's about all we can ask for. Absolutely. So, so, all right. So we went from dairy farmer to 18 out of the house, getting into construction, construction management, into insurance. Um, what have you, so you're always super consistent, like you, you, and you knock financial, I mean, you knock everything out of the park, but especially financial services. I mean, a hundred, hundred thousand in life premium every single year, I think for the last three or four years in a row at a minimum, which is really, really good. Um, already on pace for 111 this year. What do you think are some things that you all do that you and your team, because obviously this just isn't you, this is your team as well. What do you think you, you, one or two things that stick out to you that you're like, man, if, if I had to pinpoint something, this is what I would pinpoint as to how we drive so much premium, for example, because a lot of agents out there either are really good with apps or really good with premium. They're not really good with both or some will struggle. You're really good with both. So let's tackle premium first. Like, what do you think are some ways that that you and your team drive so much premium on a consistent basis? Well, I would say one of the biggest ones is probably that I, I have quite a bit of, of whole life or limited pay whole life on myself. And Jenny, my wife, is one of the team members, and she talks with uh, the customers as they come in. She explains what we have on our own family and why and how we can use the cash value and how it's there for a safety net if we need it. So she gets excited and explains the, the benefits of that. And then uh, as we, we show, so we actually we, uh, just go through and explain, explain the difference between term and, and permanent. And then also, um, I, I guess I've just got the, the process down. It started w- where I used a lot of uh, Tyler Bullington's 10 pay processes is what kind of what we had done a lot of. And that's that's actually for the last few years, what we've how we've written a, a lot of premium was just following his process. But now the last year or so, it switched over more rather than limited pay to whole life and uh, so we do, we do a lot more whole life, you know, we'll show that the triple play where we'll have term against the return of premium. And then instead of using a 20 pay life that we used to for that, we switched it over to the whole life. It seemed like when we did that, it, uh, it made that premium a lot lower for higher coverage and people are just uh, a lot more excited. And I think probably one of the biggest things is I really believe in whole life. I think whole life is a, a great product that everyone should have. So with those, uh, we train on that. The team, I suppose, because I was excited about those products, the team also follows, and that's the same thing. They don't. So if when I first started the first year, I remember asking somebody for fifty or a hundred dollars a month, and I would get nervous. That was I felt like I was asking for a lot. Well, then as I got more comfortable and did some policies that were a thousand dollars a month or even more than that, uh, then it got to the point where it's not even exciting if they're not at least a hundred or a couple hundred dollars a month. And you just kind of start to expect that we'll put that month in. And that's kind of the way the conversation goes with, with that expectation. And maybe, maybe without even saying the words, it just come, comes across that, that and they understand that that's what you're expecting. So along with that, it seems like more often than not, we do, uh, hundred dollar a month or higher whole life policies if we do term it's with the plan to convert them in the future usually you know there's some people who just like term and that's okay you know we'll do those policies too but so i think you just said something though i don't want to get i don't want anyone to overlook it you have a plan like you're meeting with your customers and you're creating a life insurance plan. You're just not slinging policies. And I think there's something to be said about that. And in talking to them, the triple play approach. So you are having an educational conversation with your customer. Hey, here's term. Here's another term option. Here's permanent. Here's what it can do for you. What are your problems? And Hey, let's create a plan that offers the solutions to your problems. Yeah. 
And one of the biggest things I like to do is just ask them, how much money can you give me a month? And you know, some of them will laugh or say, well, maybe I could give you this much. I don't know if I want to. And I'm like, well, that's okay. Let's talk about you know, what you want to or what makes sense. Yeah. Because the most important thing is, is we put something in place that fits your budget. I don't want to put something in place and you call me back in three months or a year and say, we can't afford it. But then we didn't do any good for either one of us. So let's put something in place you can, you can afford that fits your budget. And we'll go from there. We'll meet next year and add more or change it if we need to. And, and there's some that'll say, well, let's do some permanent and some term. Or there's others that'll say, ah, I would just rather put a higher permanent policy in place right now. We'll make it yep. work. And I'll usually question them a couple of times. Are you sure this is going to work? And they, if they say, yeah, then we'll go with that. So I would say I do almost the opposite of what you may expect. You may expect people that I would try to convince people to put more into it. I probably do it the opposite. You know, I probably make sure more and rather than try to push them more, I'll try mm-hmm. to hold them back a little bit. So are you sure you want to put this much in? Is this going to work for your family and for your budget? And once they say they do, then we go forward. See, I love that though, because what you will see is people overcommit sometimes because they're excited and then they have buyer's remorse. They call you back. Hey, and then instead of oh, let's lower the amount, it's I can't afford it at all. Where you're yeah. taking the approach of, hey, I don't want you to overspend because at the end of the day, if it's breaking the bank, it's not going to last anyways. And that's not a good financial plan, which is exactly what you are. You're a risk manager. You're, you're helping people plan for the future. And so I, I, I love that approach. I also love the approach that you're, you're worried in, in having conversations around, hey, can we make sure that the, we want to make sure the death benefits, right? Here's the policies that for you. And then you're creating a plan with term and permanent, or maybe term with the, with the future conversation already on the calendar of, Hey, let's get this in place. And we'll have a conversation about this later. So, and I know all this because obviously me and you work together <laughs> quite a bit. So you all, you just have really good, consistent processes. And I don't even think you give yourself probably enough credit for this. I just know this because we've been working together for two years, but you have really good consistent processes from the financial services standpoint to where not only are you writing the initial plan or policy with your consumer, but then you're what you talked about in the construction management that you learned. You have follow-up processes to, hey, let's come back in, let's visit. And so I think there's something to be really to be said about that. Yeah, it is. Consistency is, is good. In the first few years, I wasn't too consistent, probably up until I started working with you. As a matter of fact, I would they would ask me at meetings, what do you do? How do you have such good production, such good numbers? And I didn't know what to say. I would tell them, I don't know, or we just wing it. And they would, a lot of agents would actually get irritated at me. But looking back, it was the truth. I didn't, I didn't know what I was doing. I just knew I had to get it done. And I put in a lot of hours and I made a lot of calls or connections, whatever we had to do. And I never had any process. We just, just made it happen without the processes. But once you start putting processes in place, then it starts getting much easier and much more fun. (laughs) Oh, it's uh. so I think actually, let's talk about that real fast. So how long, because there's a big debate out there. Um, do you take the CEO role from the beginning? Do you take the agent and like a kind of like a glorified team member role in the beginning? Do you are you a jack of all trades? When do you work out of that team member role into the CEO role? Do you have a, any opinion or advice on that for maybe newer agents that are obviously consistent processes? You just you just said, but um, I think it's always good because everyone has a different background. Some agents are that glorified team member role never. And hey, kudos to you. I wish I could have figured that out as an agency owner starting off. Um, Some are glorified team member, CEO, janitor for first year, 18 months, three years. Um, What did that that timeline look like for you? For me, it was a... At year, year four, so the first few years, it was I was writing all the life myself. Um, a lot of the PNC and then, and I had a lot of turnover, team turnover also part the biggest reason I did is I didn't know, didn't know how to train them and I didn't have the time to train them. I would always think I'll have you sit in with meetings in a, on my meetings to learn. Well, then we, we never had the, the time they would be busy quoting and I would be 
in my meetings, and then they wouldn't be having a lot of success because they never had the training, which then would lead them to burnout at six months or a year. So once we started using your your uh, program or the, the Weaver Sales Academy, mainly the videos for training new team members what to do, we, we started with that. And uh, yeah, Drew, so he's just over a year ago. So John was before Drew. John would have been the first one. He was an intern in college, but he worked for a year and had really good success just learning from your video. And then if, if he would if he would uh, start to lose confidence, he'd go back in and watch the videos that, that in the area that were were affecting him. So, and Drew does the same thing. As soon as Drew got licensed, his first month he wrote 60 apps and he's been consistent with that or above for the last uh, year and a few months now. And I still see him at over a year in going in and uh, getting refreshed on some of the areas where where he feels like he's struggling or where maybe his, his either confidence slipped a little bit or he just forgot the, the process or let it, you know, got away from it the, the way he was supposed to be having a conversation. So that I would say when at year, must have been year, the start of year four when we started with you. And that's when I feel I went from uh, working in the agency all the time to working on the agency and where I started focusing more on having the financial service conversations. Jenny started meeting with the existing conversations to um, have the, the liability conversations and just make sure that all that coverage was in place right and mm -hmm. setting life appointments for myself. So she would explain the life insurance and what we have and set the appointment. And when they'd come in with me, they were already expecting to purchase and had an idea of what they wanted. So, and now her and Drew are both having some of those conversations herself, more of them where they're putting the life and health in place. So, um, yeah, it's been over the last two years where, where I have switched looking back, you know, I came into insurance with no knowledge at all of, of insurance and didn't understand or hadn't seen any of the processes, any of that type of stuff that other offices used. So as an agent coming in, if you're coming external, you're probably going to have a lot of the same challenges I had. You have to figure it out yourself and then train the, uh, train the team. So one thing I would say is right away, get a training program that can help you train your team so that you don't need to spend the time because you just don't have the time, can't find it. So the sooner you can get the, tra the team trained and, and to be producing, then you can go into that manager role a little more. So I wish I would have did it sooner looking back, but you can't change your past. So I learned a lot from it. And by having to do a lot myself, I learned a lot. And now I can train more on the, the life conversation and financial service conversation. So, so it's all worked out well. Now, I love the fact that you, <clears throat> you went in, you got your hands dirty, you worked them obviously everything. Okay. Glorified team member, agent, CEO, <laughs> janitor, manager. And look, as a small business owner, I think that that is okay. There's some people, I've talked to some agents out there that from day one, they were management the whole time and just driving results through the team. And, and I love, I love that. Like, I think, I think that's awesome. But at the end of the day, there's multiple ways to do this and you have to figure out the right way for you. And then you have to figure out how to grow into the person that you need to be, to be that CEO manager, which I, the, your progression has been amazing. Cause I've, I've, I've watched you go from working in the business so much to now more of that manager. Yeah. You still will have some appointments, um, especially when it, when the big money, um, conversations, but now you're driving a lot of the results through the team and it's been a lot of fun to watch. So kudos to you, my man, on, on making that journey and growing. Um, cause some people, some, some business owners and agency owners really struggle with that. And I think you got to go through the struggle. I think you got to get, go through the shit sometimes to be able to get it to, to greener pastures. And I think it, it's been fun to fun to watch you do that. Yeah, yeah, it, it's been nice uh, that I've been able to because I definitely can can see that that uh, there's a lot more opportunity to to grow. And now I have when I'm able to spend a little more time managing, I can focus on hiring 
more good team mm-hmm. members and and growing the business. Or maybe you want to take a, a month away and just go on a hunting trip or a fishing trip or go visit some family or whatever. Like work hard, play hard. So it's uh, yeah. it, it's fantastic. So man. My man, this has been good. So much, so much good stuff here. The trip, like everything you've said today. So um, let's, let's end with maybe shoot. What's uh what's one thing that if you could have changed besides investing in training, all right, you, you've said that from day one, you wish you could go back, invest in training. It would help give you time back. What's another thing that sticks out to you that you've learned along the way? Either, man, I wish I would have changed and done this differently or the best tip that's ever been given to you as a business owner or insurance agency owner. Well, maybe I'll say that what I wish I could have done and still maybe need to do is from day one, if I could have uh, figured out my ROI on marketing. Because I do, I do so much marketing and I still don't know what works. I mean, as we look back, I know referrals are our, our biggest uh, source of, of new policies we're writing, but I haven't really tracked what else. And a lot of our marketing, I feel probably leads to referrals too. So some of that stuff is, is hard, but, but if the first year, you know, you were pretty much told you had to market well, however, your sales leader told you you had to. So you just had to do a lot of stuff that you had no idea if it was working or not. So now the new agents doesn't sound like they're going to have that much pressure. So they're going to be able to start right at the at the beginning and focus on or figure out what works, try different things. So yeah, I wish I wish I would have uh, started to to figure out or to track my, my ROI on, on marketing right away, because that would have, would have helped uh, save a lot of money. I feel that is a, that is a hell of a tip. And I know that me and you've obviously had some conversations around that. And I, and I, again, you're, uh, you're one of those business owners that you, um, you don't, and I love this about you. You never give yourself enough credit. Um, cause you, I, I, <laughs> we, you, you've got a pretty good grasp on it now, but the tip you just gave is fantastic. You just can't throw money at the wall. Like as a new business owner, agency owner, know where your money's going. And even the experienced business owners like you, like we just had a money conversation, what to start the year, I think in January, February, we kind of looked at, at your budgets and everything. And so yeah. then it's, it's revisiting I like, so I look at money on a, on a weekly basis. I'm kind of, <laughs> I'm kind of, but so I look at money on a weekly basis. And then we, me and my, and Courtney, we look at our expenses, um, literally pretty much on a quarterly basis at a minimum we're looking at. And I, I think that that's a fantastic tip, Daryl. I think for all business owners, you got to know where your money's going. And yes, you're right. Marketing sometimes impressions, it is hard to track, but some of those you can track. Like, like internet leads, for example, if you're spending whatever, three grand a month, $36,000 a year on internet leads, and you're writing X amount of business, does it make sense or does it not make sense? Um, and, and so I think it's, I think you're, you're hitting the nail on the head there. I think it's really important to track that. Probably one other thing along with that is uh, it probably was about when we started working with together maybe a year before is when I started implementing the profit first system and mm. that that was huge so that's kind of another thing that that uh helped me realize where my money was going and and what to do and that I need to take a profit from the business so so that was a good turning point so I would I would encourage everyone to look into that or or do something similar to that from well, as soon as they can <laughs> wait Wait, you mean you're supposed to make money in business? <laughs> yep, before you're uh, 30. <laughs> oh, wait, you mean you're not doing this for free? <laughs> <laughs> oh shoot daryl i love this man thank you so much for your time um daryl what is uh if somebody did want to to reach out get a hold of you what's like your what's like your website that somebody could could contact you and, and get in touch with you well the uh my 
email is daryl at jolmainsurance.com. So that is probably the perfect best way to okay. send a Okay. And we'll, and guys, we'll put that in the show notes too. Um, y'all Daryl is a wealth of knowledge and, and, uh, and I'm just, I'm super proud of you and thank you so much for, for coming on. If you guys like today's episode, make sure you, uh, you, you give the insurance buzz a five-star review, let people know about us, share it, reach out to Daryl, let he, let him know some things that you enjoyed about what he had to say today. And, uh, and for all of you listening, as you know, time is the most valuable and important asset that we all have. I appreciate you all spending the last 25, 30 minutes with Daryl and I. Daryl, thank you so much again for your time, my man. All right. You're welcome. Thank you, Michael. All right. Have a good day. Thanks.